Good morning, afternoon, or evening, and welcome to the Bloody Disgusting Network. The following show is just horrifying. Beware. You're obsessed with her, and you're obsessed with her daughter! All right, easy, Geraldo. And welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking Lynch-style lurid fever dreams. We're talking a film about women made by a man that misunderstands and misrepresents women on every level. And we're talking why lesbian necrophilia is sometimes a good thing. And in case you were wondering, those are all quotes taken from female critics who reviewed this film. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace, and we're talking Abby Lee eating an eyeball without making it pop. This is true. Yeah, she just plops that sucker right in, doesn't she? I will con- yes, she does. I will confess, Joe, that you came in hard on this. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I-, I thought you were going to be way more into this movie than I was. and I- I'm like a moderate like on this movie, so I- I'm... Color me intrigued. Like, I, I'm walking into this recording, I guess, not really knowing how you feel about this movie. <laughs> well, this is true. And that's why I clarified that those are not my personal statements. Those are just from female critics. Okay. I think that this film is challenging in a number of different ways, and I'm excited to have a conversation about it. I I kind of agree. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> so mm-hmm. there, are, there are a lot of things to talk about. I like this movie, but I also don't really enjoy watching this movie, and I was kind of dreading rewatching it. So we can kind of delve into that. Once we introduce our guest, mm-hmm. who really, really likes this movie. So, yes, <laughs> everyone, he is first and foremost a writer and creator. He is the host of the Bloody Blunt Cinema Club podcast, which explores horror films through a stoner lens, which I kind of love. Mm-hmm. Joe and I were actually guests on this podcast a few months ago, discussing the found footage shocker, the Poughkeepsie tapes. And, well, if you liked me being drunk on our X-Files episode and you want to hear me discuss a film stoned, Go listen to that episode. Uh, please welcome Devon Taylor. Hello, hello. So happy to have you on the show. I'm so happy. I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. Been uh, trying to get on the show for what seems like forever. So very happy to be here. <laughs> well, as Trey said, he really didn't want to watch this movie. And this was the movie where you said, when you do this one, you have to bring me on. No. It is nothing personal. It is literally, cause I, I, I knew, because Joe was like, look, whenever we do Neon Demon, we have to have Devon on. That's going to be the guest. I was like, yeah, that's totally fine. I just don't want to watch that movie again. <laughs> and, and I like how you tried to be, you tried to be slick, too, because then you guys invited me on for the New Year's Eve episode, and I was flattered, but I was like, I don't know. I still need, <laughs> I, I want the movie that I have the most to offer with. So I see you trying to get out of it. Okay, no. I'm dying to know, because like I said, I'm a moderate like on this film. I'm like a three, three and a half. I think it's very well made. I think it looks great. It's really weird, like, watching this. Like, I was really into it for the first half, and then Mm -hmm. once it shifts into a horror movie, and this is going to make y'all laugh, I find myself so incredibly uncomfortable with so many things that happened in the last half of this movie. Right. But I don't hold that against it because it's a horror film and that means it's doing its job. Mm -hmm. So I am very uncomfortable watching a lot of this stuff. The ending leaves me like, honestly, like very upset. Like, and like, like my stomach is like, it cannot. Like, I'm just like, oh God, this makes me so uncomfortable. But I respect it for that. I'm like, oh, that's a very effective film that I just don't feel like ever watching again or enduring again. So (laughs) that being said, Devon, what is this with you? You know, I did have a very interesting journey with this movie. So 2013 was whenever I like, is when I saw Drive for the first time. I was a couple years late on seeing Drive. Mm -hmm. And then it was a movie that I watched, and I was like, this style right here, this is very much my type of shit. It was everything that Mm -hmm. I you know, enjoyed. So, of course, I went to go watch Reffin's other films, and um, I liked Only God Forgives a lot more than a lot of other people do as well. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) You know, so it was like I, I, I was going through his films, and then as I was like going through his films and becoming like kind of a fan of his style and then 
see the trailer for Neon Demon pop up. I mean, I was hype. I was hype because I was like, this looks like everything I like in a movie, the style. And the first time I watched it, I was, I don't know if it was the hype, but I was like pretty underwhelmed by it. Hmm. And then I had watched Starry Eyes, like literally like a couple of weeks yes. later. At the time I was like, Starry Eyes is doing exactly what Neon Demon was trying to do, but you know, like did it a lot better. But now I feel like they're the perfect companion pieces together. Oh, I'm glad that you brought that up because Starry Eyes is another movie that I really like, but I also never want to watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, totally understandable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've done a piece on it. Um, the pilot episode of Boy Blunt Cinema Club was uh, Neon Demon and Starry Eyes together. And um, right. I saw him as this companion piece. I realized uh, I, I have a thing for this, the subgenre of, um, you know, creatives seeking out fame and like what they're willing to do to get it. The theme of ambition is fascinating to me because it's kind of like a double-edged sword. It's like, something that could you know push you to success and triumph or is it gonna like lead to your demise so like i'm intrigued by like stories like this one starry eyes um always shine always shines like kind of another one too that kind of tackles similar themes yeah i gravitate towards that i would say always shine was one of our very first episodes (laughs) that's such a i mean yeah it is kind of a trifecta films i do like that comparison so I've actually written a comparison piece between the Neon Demon and Starry Eyes for film and fishnets, and I called it the Edible Star. <laughs> Love it. Well, okay. So, Devon, we know why you like this. Um, and we know what you think about this movie. And we'll obviously, as we talk about the film in detail, we'll go into more of that. Joe, mm-hmm. yeah, what are your general thoughts on this film? Yeah, this is interesting. I'm actually a little bit closely aligned with you, Trace, where I do quite like the melodrama of the first half and then when it switches to the horror films. So basically right after Jesse walks the runway at the fashion show for Mm -hmm. Sorna, that's kind of where it starts to lose me. But then I get picked back up when Jesse as full-blown narcissist comes back into play and then everything in the tail end I'm really on board with. So it's it's just a kind of hazy, lynchian, surreal, nightmare fuel stuff in the not quite middle, but like second act that it doesn't entirely lose me, but I find that I'm not as engaged. I can see that. This is a two-hour movie that I will admit feels a bit longer to me, but only because so much of it is just looking at things. Like, there is dialogue all throughout this film, but it's not like... This isn't a talky movie, you know? And it's a lot of people saying the same shit over and over. Like, oh, look at her. She's so pretty. She's perfect. She has that thing. Blah, blah, blah. The movie feels narcissistic. It feels pretentious, but it's also because... It's like embodying the very thing that it's, well, I'm going to say critiquing, although I know that Refn has gone on on record saying that this film is not a critique. It's quote unquote, just a horror movie. (laughs) Yeah, I I mean, I think it's important for us to acknowledge right off the top that Refn is, he's almost a political figure in the way that he likes to push buttons. And I think sometimes part of what he's saying gets lost in translation because he is Danish and I think he also has a bit of a wry sense of humor, which doesn't always grate well when he's being accused of being too violent or being misogynistic or all of these other things. He has an I don't give a fuck attitude that I admire. So I did get to interview him for this film. I actually didn't really have a connection with him beforehand. I had seen Drive, but even when I had seen Drive, I wasn't like, oh my God, like Nicholas Winding Refn. Like I've never seen the Pusher films Oh, I have seen Bronson, but I really don't like it. And I know that's a very minority opinion because people love Bronson. Mm. I do think Only God Forgives is fine, but I walked in preparing for the worst. But I think I saw that even after the Neon Demon. So when he was doing his press tour, he did visit Austin and I got to interview him. And it's interesting because uh, you walked in and he really wanted to talk to women about this film. He wanted to know women's perspectives. And as soon as I walked in... It was very clear that he really did not care what any man thought about this film. Right. And I found it Hmm. very intimidating. And I have my list of questions, but even going across it, I'm blaming myself partially for this because the questions I asked are a lot of the same questions that everyone asked him. And he had the exact same answers, like the stock answers that he gave for everything. Right. So I didn't really like delve like beneath the surface here. Needless to say, I didn't get a good, like I got just a very 
scary vibe from him as a person. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. He comes off to me as like, I don't know, like when I see him doing like TikTok dances with his kids, I'm like, this is just like a really like goofy, eccentric dude. But like, Mm -hmm. you know, and and his films are, you know, very divisive. And, you know, I am very much attracted to, you know, the quote unquote auteur directors, you know, like uh, Gaspar Noé, of course, is like another favorite of mine. And like, you know, because I search out this uncomfortable feeling Whenever right. I watch films. I do want to make it clear that my opinion of Refn has nothing to do with my opinion of the film. Because I, mm. I do love Drive. Again, I don't really want to watch that much because it's just like, it's a lot of movie <laughs> to like absorb. And, but I really do think that more so that Refn was defensive. Because I think he was prepared for critiques of this film. Mm-hmm. He was prepared for misogynistic accusations. And I think that's why he was like, I'm more interested in what women think. Because... As Joe said, to kick this off, this is a film made by a man. Yes, the script Mm -hmm. is co-written by two other women, and he did ask Elle Fanning for input and change some of Jesse's dialogue based on Elle Fanning's input. But at the end of the day, this is still a film about women made by a man. And so I think he was just ready for it. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I I don't blame him. You know, he he definitely directs with a almost off-putting confidence you know, but at the same time, when you make the films that he tries to make, you know, I think you just like kind of have to have some of that to to you. And, you know, and like, yeah, it might kind of kind of come off cocky or pretentious in a way. But I don't know if, if you're going to if you're going to make something, you know, the way he does it, you got to believe in it. I don't know. Yeah. I think part of the problem, too, is that when people try to take his films as literal Mm. When they try to take them literally, when they try to deconstruct them as films that are traditionally plot or character driven, right? Because he makes visually aesthetic films, like he makes experiential Mm -hmm. films. And Mm. I think for me, when I was looking at the reactions to this film, and I've got quite a number of female critics that I'm going to draw on throughout Mm -hmm. the episode, one of the things that kept coming up was this kind of imbalance And not just women, to clarify, uh, the critics who were taking the film at face value and saying, what is this film saying about the fashion industry and the relationships between women? They were often saying, okay, well, this is a fucking straight white dude who's making a movie about young girls and it's just women backstabbing and eating each other and they don't like it. Cannibalizing each other metaphorically and literally. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But I did find that the people who were looking at the film less as a statement about fashion and, you know, female competitiveness, I think they were finding richer, more varied conversations. So it kind of depends on how you approach it. But then Refn also doesn't make it easy because when you look at things like the sound bites that he's delivering, not so much in the TikToks, Devon, but definitely <laughs> in like when he was doing the press circuit for this, he would say things like, this movie isn't political. He would say things like, there's a 16 year old girl inside of every man. He would say, yeah. the art is meant to penetrate you, and Hollywood is like a prostitute. So, like, there are certain things that I think he was doing to deliberately trigger people because he wanted to be controversial. Yeah, I, I could, I can totally see that. You know, it's like when you do these like press circuits and stuff, it's like you can either a just like kind of go through the motions and kind of sleepwalk mm-hmm. through it. Or it's like, you know, almost a manipulative tactic itself, kind of the way his films do as well. It's interesting that, you know, people like to analyze his films, you know, very symbolically. And like, you know, like you said, try to figure out what the symbols mean, what they saying, but then also trying to say like, this isn't how women are portrayed realistically but is he even trying to portray reality he's like one of those directors like it's reality but his version of reality like no i will admit that that was a hurdle on my first viewing of this film i mean again watching this movie in a theater i was just kind of like okay what is this joe knows this i watch things very literally very much at face value so watching Mm -hmm. this movie i was kind of like oh my god like what is going on in this movie and so when it takes the turn when they spoiler everyone if you haven't seen this movie when they murder jesse i was very much like oh (laughs) our protagonist is dead and there's still like 30 minutes of this movie left Mm -hmm. and the criminals don't get punished Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but also like like Jesse becomes kind of a bitch by the end of this movie, right? And th- that's the point 
I, I, I'm loathe to even comment on the thoughts about female friendships because while obviously I'm not a female and none of us are, from an outside perspective, like I've seen females attack each other, but it's also because it's it's coming from like this society that pits women against each other already, and so I mm-hmm. we'll talk about it more as we get into it, especially as we get into like how these things how the film progresses. But I don't know, I, I kind of like whatever. Reffin's doing here, I, I was more shocked by his statement where he was like, oh, I wasn't trying to make critique, a, a critique about anything. I wasn't trying to make a statement. And I was like, really? Because it really seems like you are. <laughs> well, and that's where I think he's kind of taking the piss. Like, maybe he legitimately doesn't believe it. We won't know because it's not like we have him on hand to ask. But that to me sounds like a bit of a joke, right? Like, you have to know that you're making a political statement when you're making a film embodying a culture, embodying a gender that is completely different from you. And I do think he he did some of his due diligence. And I was frustrated by some of the criticisms, particularly like the Vox article by Haley Hughes, whose headline is the neon demon tries to both fetishize and vilify young girls, it fails. And then she has that opening line about a film about women made by a man, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I was frustrated because it very much does lean into the idea that this is an auteur and that no women were consulted in the making of this film. And I I don't agree with that. There's two female (laughs) co-writers, his wife worked on the film, his cinematographer, all of the actresses on the film said that he was very receptive to how they wanted to be portrayed and like i don't know i'm always wary when we try to diminish art down to a single person Mm -hmm. and i think that might be part of the reason that like maybe that i love this movie as much as i do and like much more than you guys because like even though i love listening to directors and stuff he's surprisingly like a director i have not really watched interviews about or read interviews about So, like, I didn't, like, hear any of this, like, or any of the things that he was saying. So, like, it makes it easier for me, I guess, to go into this film as this, like, kind of wonderland. And, like, as Mm -hmm. we go throughout the film and I kind of explain my theory, my personal theory of what the film is, it's, like, I'm definitely not drawing on, like, what he might have intended. Like, I very much, like, am making these own assumptions just based off of what I see. I think that's okay, and I think that's actually what Refn wants. Me, I'm like, no, I want to know what happens. I want to know what (laughs) what he's doing here. So I I will do the research because I want to know, even though, like, as we've discussed multiple times on this podcast, as soon as art leaves the creator, it's subjective. It is in the hands of whoever's Mm -hmm. viewing it. So if you watch this movie and say, make some outlandish statement about what you think it's doing, that's what you're getting from it. And so, Mm -hmm. Devon, I don't think there's anything wrong with how you're consuming this film. Like, if anything, that's, yeah, that's that's Refn's intent. Like, he wants to know what you're getting from this just from what you're seeing and hearing on screen. I'm just too stubborn. I want to fucking know what Refn's doing, even if he doesn't want me to. (laughs) You gotta let go. (laughs) And here's the thing. The film also isn't that deep, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Part of this is that if you're trying to look at it from simply a plot-based experience... I think you're probably doing yourself a disservice because the film seems less interested in that itself. Well, what I'm getting from this is a very on-the-nose statement. I do think a lot of this movie is very on-the-nose. Right. Not necessarily incorrect statements, but it's just like, okay, we get it, dude. You don't have to hammer it over our heads for two hours, but, you know, we get it. Hmm. Again, I go back and forth a lot when I'm watching this movie. Well, I think if nothing else, it's really good for instigating conversation and dialogue. Like, whether you love this film, whether you fucking hate it, whether you think it's too on the nose, whether you think it's a sensory experience, people can have a lot of meaningful exchanges about this because the film does invite this. And it is both simple but also complicated enough to allow for all of that to happen. Yeah. See, and that's why it's fun. That's why I like this movie and movies like this because... No matter how you feel about it, like, if you have people talking, that's what excites me about a film. Yeah. See, I like, I love this. Like, mm, we're having so much fun already. I can't wait. <laughs> well, all right. So before we get into the plot, I have a couple production notes, nothing major. But let's go through this a little bit just to kind of see, because I do have some of reference quotes as well. So basically, November of 2014, reference production company Space Rocket Nation, alongside its co-financiers, Gaumont Film Company and Wild Bunch, announced that reference next film would be titled The Neon Demon, filming in L.A. in early 2015. Around that same time, too, it was reported that the film was inspired by Elizabeth Bathory. So, 
I think that makes a lot of sense <laughs> when you're watching the film. Sure. Oh, Refn yeah. commented on the conception of the project, saying, and this is, hey, here, we can speculate here. I woke up one morning a couple of years ago and was like, well, I was never born beautiful, but my, my wife was. And I wondered what it had been like going through life with that reality. I came up with the idea to do a horror film about beauty, not to criticize it or to attack it, but because beauty is a very complex subject. Everyone has an opinion about it. And mm. just like that, so will people about this film. I mean, the end of that is very telling, mm. isn't it? Like, everybody will have an opinion about it, and they will have an opinion about my film. Yes. He wrote those literal words into a scene, like, later in the <laughs> film. Like, that, that's literally what they say in that uh, that bar scene. No, but did he say, beauty isn't everything, it's the only thing. That's, like, the one line I take away from this movie. Well, bo- I say every time I watch it. Both times I've watched it. <laughs> But yeah, he continues, I decided I made enough films about violent men, and I wanted to do a film with only women in the film. So I did this story because my wife would only go to LA if we had to travel out of Copenhagen. She's like, I'm done with Asia. I will only do Los Angeles. And so I came up with an idea and went to LA. And maybe this is where the language barrier comes in, Joe, because his exact quote for this is, and I cast this woman called Elle Fanning. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, who was absolutely fantastic, and she played the lead. Uh, It was a great moment. I actually don't like men. Even though I've made a lot of films with men in them, I'm not a guy guy. I don't really (laughs) like hanging out with guys. I don't do guy stuff. I love women. I love anything feminine. I love pink. I love dolls. I only have daughters. That 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 quote also... (laughs) That's mildly amusing, yeah. Did you genetically engineer your children to make sure they were daughters? <laughs> or, like, if you had a boy, like, did you, like, send him, did you return him to the pile? Well, the Danes, you know, they are more advanced than us in some ways. <laughs> I mean, again, like, I, 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 so I'm glad that you brought up that language barrier, Joe, because I just feel like I'm like, look, I feel like a lot of this feels very stiff and robotic. It doesn't feel, I don't know, I, it, it rubs me the wrong way a little bit. They're like speaking another language. Yes. His films, their dialogue, they're like kind of like uh, like Yorgos, like Yorgos Lanthimos. Like, uh. It's like they're speaking English, but it's like an alien trying to replicate English. <laughs> and see, that's how I feel about Elle Fanning in this movie, because I think Elle Fanning delivers a very Yorgos lanthimos performance. And listeners, if you don't know Yorgos Lanthimos, he's the director of such films like The Killing of a Sacred Deer, The Favorite, The Lobster... Yeah, he, he he always directs his actors to deliver lines without emotion. It's just like straight out of the mouth, no inflection whatsoever. And that's how Elle Fanning is in this movie to me. Abby Lee kills that too. I, I don't I don't entirely agree with either of those statements. <laughs> <laughs> I think that everyone in this is giving mostly subdued performance, but I don't feel like they're aliens who are grappling with a foreign language. I just don't think Elle Fanning emotes a lot. And this is not to say that I don't think she's good in this movie. I just don't think a lot is asked of her other than to stand there and look pretty. Right. Yeah, that, you're not wrong in that regard. It was interesting. While you were talking, Trace, I looked it up because I realized I was getting strong Aurora from Maleficent vibes from this. Mm. Oh, and that's who it is. <laughs> But it did remind me that I saw a couple of people, and I think even Refn himself mentioned that they considered this a kind of fairy tale, right? So if you Mm -hmm. look at Jesse as a bit of an Alice in Wonderland figure who goes through the looking glass, mirror, mirror, everywhere, fucking in this movie. Right. I think it also kind of makes sense that she is not just the ingenue, but she's also the character who is exploring this new world, and she doesn't understand the rules. I do want to point out, too, so, because I was trying to do the age math here, but Fanning was actually 16 when they filmed this movie, which I find ick. impressive, but yes, also kind of ick. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically the scene when Desmond Harrington is rubbing gold paint on her titties. Oh, uh, we'll talk about that. Upper, upper chesticles, yes. There you go. Upper, upper chesticles. Interesting question before we go on, because mm-hmm. I know you guys are a fan of camp. Tone mm-hmm. and performance-wise... Would you consider this movie camp? No. No. I do. I don't think wait. it's outlandish enough. Well, yeah, so wait, well, well, explain that, Devon. Why do, you, why do you consider this camp? It's in the dialogue and in the way that it's delivered with an earnestness, but at the same time, like, it, it has that, 
how Joe Bob Riggs would describe as European vibe uh, to it. And I think there's some weird dark comedy moments that come very unexpectedly. And it's like kind of off kiltering. So like that kind of contributes to like the campness and the tone. But mm-hmm. I don't know. That's kind of the way that I choose to watch it. I could see that maybe in Keanu Reeves' scenes. I do think there's a darkly comedic bent here, but I don't know if I would consider it camp. I would just consider it satirical or darkly comedic. Right. But again, you know, that's me taking it in. I think Jenna Malone has given us camp here. I mean, she's given us a lot of things. Jenna Malone gives us camp in Antebellum. She is not giving us camp here. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, though, if you're going to walk away from this movie remembering any single character and like necrophilia scene beside the right. point, I think Jenna Malone walks away with this movie like she is a fucking amazing. This is a performance for the ages for me. And I mm-hmm. also say that as someone who really, really enjoys Jenna Malone. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah, in November 2015, Amazon Studios acquired distribution rights for the film in the United States. In partnership with Broad Green Pictures, Uh, the film had its world premiere at the 2016 Cannes Film Festival, where apparently it not only, it it simultaneously received booze and a 17 minute long standing ovation. Yeah, that's Cannes for you. Love it. When I hear about that, though, I'm like, okay, look, (laughs) if I'm in this audience, I'm not standing my ass up for 17 minutes to clap for any movie. I don't care what the fuck it is. They do this kind of shit all the time. It's so weird. If that's how long they're booing, that's how long I'm standing. Ooh. (laughs) It it was one of those. But again, I I think, yeah, Devon, you're right. Divisive movies are more fun to talk about because clearly the movie's doing its job. (laughs) There we go. So um, it was released in the United States on June 24th, 2016. It had a very small theatrical release, so we're looking at a budget of seven million dollars, and it opened in the number fifteen slot with about with almost six hundred thousand dollars of box office. But it was seven hundred and eighty six theaters. It wound up grossing one point three million domestically, two million internationally for a worldwide gross of three point eight million dollars. So wow. But I never know, though, because, again, technically, it's a flop. Like, this movie made less than half of its production budget. But because of the distribution model, I don't mm-hmm. know if maybe there was another deal there. Like, if Amazon somehow, like, banked for something. I, I don't really know how that works, to be honest. Amazon's not a great distributor. Like, they, they've barely gotten their feet wet at this point. So it's also not surprising that they weren't able to open it in very many markets. I wonder if they were just playing the long game, thinking, oh, it's good to be working with this esteemed director and also will be able to then send this to Prime. Yeah, yeah. which that's where I watched it. So, <laughs> yay. Maybe that's how they got Reffin to do uh, that series, too, that he did. Right. On, that, I that didn't know that time. existed. But yeah, Jenna Malone returns in that series, and so does Carl Glusman, the guy that plays Dean. He's in that, in that show as well. Yeah, okay. Hmm. But yeah, it, it did divide critics, although reception was higher than I thought. Uh, we're looking at a 59% on Rotten Tomatoes with an average score of 6 out of 10, and a Letterboxd average score of 6.4 out of 10. Hmm. And uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. sounds about right yeah yeah okay shall we dig into this let's let's do it <laughs> all right so following some glittery neon credits we open on jesse who is played by l fanning and she is being photographed with a slit throat on a chaise lounge by small time photographer dean who as you mentioned trace is played by carl glusman 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 oh my god <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen him in anything, but he reminds me of, um, he has like that Rami Malek face. I like him a lot. He was in a uh, Gaspar Noé's film Love, and he is yes. also dating Zoe Kravitz. Uh, they were divorced. Oh, they divorced? Never mind. They got divorced sad two face. years ago. <laughs> oh, sad face. <laughs> they were married dead. for about a year. <laughs> they were cute. Yeah. I mean, this is an interesting opening scene, right? Because right from the get-go, it's meant to be a bit of a a shock, but also a twist, right? Where you think, oh, what's the deal with this dead woman? And then you realize, oh, this isn't the horror film you think just yet. This is a staged photo. Well, it's also telling of the, it's telling of the finale, though, too. Mm -hmm. It it could be Uh, looked at that way as well. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this film does a lot of foreshadowing, too. 
I mean, again, yeah, I don't know why I was shocked that she gets killed at the end of this movie because it's it's written on the walls. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you don't expect the women to push her into an empty pool and then eat her. That's not the kind of thing you see every day. That's kind of the thing, right? Like, I mean, it, w- while this film does have a very surreal, um, as you said, Joe, Lynchian quality to it, uh, yeah, I was never expecting full blown, oh, cannibalism. Although, I guess by the time the necrophilia happens, I should have been cued in. It just felt Canadian to me. Is this movie very Canadian? No, like weird sex shit that's Canadian. Oh. <laughs> We've talked about this. <laughs> Sorry, it's Monday, y'all, <laughs> for us. <laughs> I mean, it's a little Cronenbergian, if that's what you mean by Canadian. Well, there is that. I mean, in, in general, Canadian films have a tendency to have the art house aesthetic, but also we aren't afraid of having weird sex in our films. So the idea of uh, necrophilia, bestiality, incest, if you watch some of the more prestigious Canadian films, you will have encountered all of those themes. Okay, so uh, afterwards, she is getting cleaned up, and she is observed by makeup artist Ruby, who is played by Jenna Malone, and they have a conversation that offers some exposition about who Jessie is. You know, she's new to LA, she doesn't have parents, and Ruby is both intrigued and also kind of visually attracted to her. Yes, um, and this is really all the information we'll get about Jessie in the entirety of this film. Yeah, I think she's meant to be deliberately enigmatic. Yes. And right in in this exchange, too, like, Ruby is already, like, on the prowl, like, immediately. The first thing that she comments about Jessie is her skin. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of the thing, right, too, though? Like, Ruby is a predatory lesbian character in this film. Yep. To the point where she does attempt to rape Jessie at the end of this, I'm sorry, towards the end of this film. Sure. And it's interesting to me, Trace, that you said, oh, it's uncomfortable that a 16-year-old Elle Fanning was being manhandled by Desmond Harrington. She literally has the exact same interaction with Ruby here. Well, I guess, no. And and you know what, though? Maybe that's because uh, society has groomed me to realize it in men and to be like, oh, women can't be rapists, blah, 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 because they're women. So it's like... A bias. I mean, obviously, I don't believe that, but like, it's something that I'm not like jumping to thinking of, like, oh yeah, this is actually also very uncomfortable. Like, mm-hmm. instead, I'm watching it thinking, oh, this is just something that women do with each other, which isn't always the case. <laughs> I mean, I'll say, like, yes, Ruby does fall into the predatory lesbian trope, but it was like, I don't know if it softens the blow that all the women in this movie are, you know, out to kill her, you know, and and not saying that a rape scene is ever good or anything. Yeah. But it's obviously, like you said, like something that you also don't see, like in a film, a, a woman sexually assaulting another woman. I mean, oh. So it's like, I don't know if it's like, you know, like you said, he wants these violent women. I get where you're coming from, Devon, though, because, okay, I'm going to try to say this in the nicest way possible without, like, seeming like a creep. When the sexual assault scene happened, I thought to myself, oh, I like this. Not because I liked the sexual assault, but I liked that it was a rare instance in a film that, yeah, it is a woman committing the sexual assault. And not only that, but it's a woman committing the sexual assault on another woman. Like, it's just not something you see. If I sound like a real douchebag for saying that, I'm sorry, but like... (laughs) I think we can clarify it. You're not saying that you enjoy the idea of a sexual assault, but just the acknowledgement that women can also be predators and they can also do it to other women. Yes, correct. And be as vapid to the degree that they are. Like, there aren't too many movies I can think of off the top of my head where, you know, not only is it a female antagonist, but also just like, you know, when we have those like truly vile, evil characters like the Patrick Batemans or, you know, people like that, obviously mm-hmm. it's like a lot of the times they're played by male actors mm-hmm. and they're male characters. So it is something, it, it, it is refreshing. I mean, honestly, the closest thing I can think to it in recent memory is something like Nurse 3D. But that, oh Devon, is your camp. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> On the list. Oh dear. Okay. I think also we should probably note that this is a film that's almost entirely populated by bad people. So it's not like there's really anyone to cheer for except for Jesse, and even she is eventually corrupted. So there is, I mean, you could again say this is a very on-the-nose portrayal, but it's kind of like, oh, when you go to Hollywood, you will also be consumed by the city and what it does to people. I do like her progression, though, because, yeah, she's this, like, this innocent, naive waif 
doesn't really have a strong voice, doesn't speak up for herself very often, she just kind of says things, as you do, but, um, and it's just on the nose, yeah, Los Angeles, Hollywood will eat you alive, unless mm. you claw your way out of it. Become the monster yourself, if there you yes, will. exactly. Yeah. I guess this is a good time to introduce my theory that I can pile on as we go. Go for it. So, I have this three witch theory. I think that uh, Sarah, Gigi, and Ruby, they are witches of sorts, or wannabe witches even. Maybe not even. And they want to do this ritual, so they're they're grooming Jessie. But Mm -hmm. they're only supposed to groom her to a point to where she is still under their control. But then as the film goes on, they do too good of a job. Jessie starts feeling it, and then she transforms, you know, past where they wanted her. And she becomes too powerful, hence why whenever they eat her, they have bad results at the end. I was going to say. I'll continue on. So yeah, yeah, no, hold that and like because yeah, well, as as we talk about scenes, well, we can go to that. But so so wait, did, you think that they were gonna kill her from the get go? Like 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 this first scene with Ruby where she's talking to her and feeling her up basically is the initial like, oh, you're our next mark, you're our next victim. Because again, if we're going after yes. the Elizabeth Bathory comparison, we're to believe that these women have been doing this for a while. They 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 kill women, bathe in their blood, eat them to stay young and youthful and retain that Hollywood glamour. Well, Gigi and Sarah, not really Ruby. <laughs> I think yes, the, their entire plan was they are going to kill her. They find this, you know, new, fresh, pure soul for their ritual. But what I think is, I don't think they've been doing it long. I think that's why they fuck it up is because they haven't done this before. Mm. There's a scene where. Another model is talking about a model that's getting older and desperate and said, like, oh, she's looking for some baby seal fat. And, like, you know, so it's, like, kind of talking about these women, Sarah and Gigi, that, you know, they became desperate enough to where they go, oh, hey, let's do this bathory ritual and eat and (laughs) bathe in her blood and see if that, you know, gives us more life and beauty. But they don't do a good job of it. I actually think you're right. I I think this is maybe a first time try for them. The only reason I was like, well, maybe not, is because of all the the occult tattoos we see on Ruby in one of her final scenes. Mm -hmm. I think you're both actually right, which is that Ruby is the ringleader and she kind of knows what she's doing, which is why she's fine, apart from, you know... A a, a bloody episode? (laughs) A a slight torrential escapade of blood that comes out of that vagina, yes. Yeah. But I think, yeah, Gigi and Sarah seem to have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. No, she she's totally the ringleader, hence why she is the makeup artist. She uh, isn't a model oh. herself, but she helps create beauty. You know, <laughs> she has a hand in beauty, so it's like, look at you! <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you, I got some notes, y'all. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, speaking of Gigi and Sarah, who, as we said, are played by Abby Lee and Bella Heathcote, I thought it's funny that... Both of them are Australian, but only one of them gets to play Australian. But, meh, whatever. Mm. They are introduced at a fun party that Ruby takes Jesse to. And I feel like we could say this for every exchange, but I do love the conversation, even if it is on the nose, about the women who buy makeup products based on are they food or are they sex. I do love that bathroom scene. It, it sets the tone for the film. I feel like that's a scene like, it might be an early indicator, like, if you're not into, if you're, like, kind of not feeling it, you might not enjoy the rest of the film going forward. Right. But I think it does give us, like, this insight into the women, and it gives me, again, American Psycho vibes, you know, mm-hmm. these conversations that they're having, and, like, also how Jesse, Gigi, and Sarah are all the same type. They all look the same, just slight variations. You know, Jesse's just the younger version of them. Yeah, actually, the American Psycho comparison is very apt because a lot of the shop talk and even like we we get mention of like a body shop that Gigi has come fresh out of. (laughs) And it does feel like, oh, we're comparing business cards. Oh, what is your emboss? What is your font? What color is that card? (laughs) Yeah. And see, I I was listening to all of this, but I was also like... This is a party, and this is the emptiest bathroom. Like no one else <laughs> ever comes in here. And again, the, the, I, I'm gonna reach with like, a, like a, a metaphor here, though, where I was like, well, maybe there are people in this bathroom, but we're, they just don't see them because these women are so vapid and self-absorbed; they only see themselves. Well, the women are invisible if you hit a certain age, so maybe they're surrounded by like 25 year olds, right? 
<laughs> or they're doing coke in the stalls. Or there's that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It, it's a party, folks. Come on. Yes. <laughs> so I, I think you're right, Devon, that these opening scenes will also tell you whether this is a film for you. Because there is then a, not extremely long, but a fairly lengthy strobe light performance art show. And it's very visually captivating. And we get to see meaningful looks between the girls that you can read into. But if you're more of a literal minded viewer, you might be like, uh, are we This is going on, on for so long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's all a part of the trance, you know, like I, right. I, I, I get lost in this movie. It has that, you know, that hypnotic effect and uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm here for it. It's the strobe light. <laughs> I, I, I'm envious of that, Devon, because yeah, for me, I mean, like something like Clim- Gaspar Noe's Climax, I'm more into like with that kind of a stuff because I still feel like there's things happening where I mean, like, even though it's a lot of just like, oh yeah, we're looking at things. We're not really like, there's nothing else going on, but like, there's something more captivating there. Whereas for this, I'm just kind of like, oh my God, this is like minute five of just people looking at strobe lights. Like, let's go, <laughs> movie. <laughs> All right, well, let's go. So the next day we watch as Jesse signs with Roberta Hoffman, who is played by Ruffin's regular Christina Hendricks. And she is encouraged to both lie about her age, so go from 16 to 19 when asked. And she is also set up on a test with notable photographer Jack MacArthur, who is played by Desmond Harrington. An unrecognizable Desmond Harrington. Oh, my God. (laughs) It's funny, I get him mixed up with Alessandro Nivola, who's also in this Mm. film. Oh, the men look very similar, yeah. But um, I I know you guys had, you know, you talked about um, a a weird feeling about the photography scene. And for me, like, Desmond Harrington is like a scene stealer in this movie for me. He brings this, he has this presence to him and this look and the way he delivers his lines and And I kind of watched this photography scene as like, yes, it is a little bit weird and uncomfortable considering one, Elfang was 16 filming it, and it is still kind of a weird thing for a photographer to do, but at the same time, I see the scene as like, this is a scene where you think like, oh, she's going to go do this photo shoot, he's going to ask everybody to leave, and he's going to like, you know, try to do something to her, and it like Mm kind of builds the suspense, and then it subverts it, you know, it's just like, he just is there making art with her. She has this great photo shoot with him. And then when she comes out of it for the first time, she's like excited and confident after a photo shoot. So it's like this could have been a very like gross scene. And I think a lot of people might have anticipated. And I think it's interesting that they subverted it. And it's also Mm -hmm. like my favorite score track of the movie. Cliff Martinez kills the score. Oof. Mm. I agree with that. I do want to emphasize. I don't have any issues, even though that Fanning was 16 filming this movie, I don't have any issues with this scene in the real world. Like, I'm sure this scene was filmed very professionally. I'm sure sure she had some kind of chest plate on, because obviously we don't see Fanning nude, whatever. But watching him spread the paint all over her, it is very uncomfortable. But that hypnotic aspect that you're talking about, Devon, comes back in because it's just like... I don't know, like, it's, it's like, what, a single take of him just rubbing this paint all over her? It, it's mm-hmm. beautiful to look at, while mm. also being very uncomfortable. Right. Yeah, uh, I'm going to introduce one of the female critics that I mentioned off the top. So I found a lot of really good content in Lauren Wilford's Gradient article, I'm a Feminist and I Loved the Neon Demon. And one of the things that struck me from her piece is this particular scene. So when I watch it, I'm like, oh, he's creepy because of his line delivery. And you're right, Devon, it definitely seems like he's going to take advantage of her. And I think this is the film again playing with our expectations and subverting them. And then Lauren Wilford writes of Jesse, she thought she was to be prey and instead she is worship. She tilts her head back in rapture as he glides the gold up her neck and the white of the backdrop now appears to be light radiating from her. So it's an interesting subversion, but this is also where Jesse truly starts to become a star and she feels worshiped and, it's very important that she then comes out and Ruby immediately says, oh, you need to stay away from him. He's not good for you. And that's when Jesse starts to assert herself that she's not helpless. Right. We should also note that in between these scenes, we have been introduced to her shady Pasadena motel, uh, <laughs> which is also broken into. And that's where we meet Hank, who is played by Keanu Reeves. And he's got some kind of muscle side piece, Mikey, who is played by Charles Baker. <laughs> and they also discover a mountain lion inside her room. 
Okay, so do, do we have any thoughts about the symbolism of the mountain lion? I do. Devon, do you want to start? Well, this is, again, just a wild theory of mine. Mm-hmm. Playing into Ruby being the main witch, I sometimes wonder... Is she the mountain lion? It's a oh fun. God, there's, no. I have no context for that. <laughs> I have Devon, no context for that. But it's fun. It's a fun idea. But um, but I do love. I mean, I'm a big Keanu Stan, and I love him playing against type. You know, he's always a mm. nice guy generally, and I mean, he actually does some like pretty good acting of being a sleaze ball and being mm. gross. Oh and yeah, he's, he's real creepy. <laughs> Yeah, you've named your character Hank. He's obviously going to be skeezy. Hank Hill has a word for you. Oh, God. (laughs) Okay, so my theory is that this is foreshadowing the predatory pussy. Because when we finally get to (laughs) Ruby's house that she's house-sitting, she actually has big cats all over the house. Uh, Mm Oh, okay. So it's like, beware, she who has large cats. Wait, doesn't someone say that? No, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of Pink Pussy with the lipstick conversation. Oh, yeah. Pink. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. There's just a lipstick called Predatory Pussy. <sighs> I'm sure it's out there. Well, yeah. I mean, again, I don't think there's any wrong way to read any of this stuff. I mean, you can watch it literally like me and be like, oh, that's interesting. A mountain lion made its way into her room. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, it is Pasadena. Like, you do have wild animals who live in the hills. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's totally a thing. Or you can watch it super stoned and believe that people turn into mountain lions. Like <laughs> right. Are you sure you weren't watching cat people, Devon? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Throw that on your list. The 80s one, because it's a little bit more stylish. Oh, you're not talking sleepwalkers? No, no I'm talking cat, cat people. people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll like it. Anyway, we'll cut that part up. <laughs> All right, so then we get this great diner scene where Ruby meets with Sarah and Gigi, and they are both incredibly dismissive of Jesse, and they also make a poor waitress run through all of the specials, and I kind of love it. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, well, she went through all the trouble to memorize it. Now, I, <laughs> I okay, maybe this makes me a dick, but I'm like, I kind of get it. Like, yeah, like, you had to memorize it. Go ahead. Like, show it off. Do it for me. I do love that line. But I also do like the line that it feeds into my theory is when she says she's not special yet. So, mm-hmm. like, I feel like that kind of hints at this, again, like, grooming aspect of, like, they're getting her ready, you know, for, oh, for this sure. ritual thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they all recognize that she has a thing, but they think that it's passing, except for Ruby, who believes that it can be developed and it will be developed. And then, of course, we go straight into the Robert Sarno, who is played by Alessandro Navola, and he is doing this casting audition in which a just fucking giant group of women are waiting in nude underwear to walk for this guy who could not give two fucks about any of them. This, though, this is where your American Psycho comparison comes in, because this scene is the business card scene. Because Mm. the walks we get are the exact same fucking walks. (laughs) Yes, I did realize that, especially this time around. The first time I didn't really catch it, but this time I was like, what is it about Elle Fanning that makes her special to all of these people? Because you see the other girls and they all look equally gorgeous, equally beautiful. They have the same great walk. They're exactly the same body shape and height. And you're just thinking, oh, okay, there's the criticism. Yeah. It's like Ruby said that she has the thing, whatever Mm -hmm. that is. She has that thing in her. And I think that I think that thing is the neon demon. That's what's in her. But yeah. it is also um, another kind of similar scene to in Starry Eyes whenever she does an audition and it's all these women that look the same. Another nice little parallel between those movies. Oh my god, that second audition scene in Starry Eyes, though. Ooh, epic. That is epic. That's where, for me, yeah, the satire comes in. because, And this is not me saying Elle Fanning is not attractive. Obviously, Elle Fanning is a very attractive young woman. Mm-hmm. But... There's nothing about her that I'm like, oh, like, your head's and tails above this girl. But that's the point. Yeah. You see how he's in, like, awe of her, though, too. Like, he is, like, as soon as she walks up, he's, like, like, you know. But that's the joke. It's like. Oh, yeah. You're saying the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Because that's that's what the. Yeah, we don't need to explain it. No, but it, it, it's on the nose. I mean, again, as soon as, as soon as she walks up, you know, because, yeah, he doesn't watch Sarah do shit. 
as soon as he walks up and he's like, oh, it's like, okay, movie, I see what you're doing. And I realize I sound, like, flippant or, like, I'm dismissing this. No, I, I, I get what it's doing. I like what it's doing. It's just very obvious at what it's doing. Right. And again, I think that's one of the reasons why when people criticize the film and they say, oh, it's such a shallow characterization of what modeling and fashion and makeup and L.A. is like. But that's kind of the point. Like, I don't think the film is trying to be any more critical than that if it is even being critical like if we take Ruffin at his word then it's not but if we don't believe him and we have our own interpretation I, I just struggle <laughs> with the people who say like oh well this film is shallow and I'm like but that's the point yeah it's a shallow movie about shallow people about a shallow locale yeah. but it's <laughs> gorgeous and yeah. evocative and immersive like mm -hmm. that to me is where the film's strengths lie yeah yeah it, like it sucks you in but again it it isn't a movie you're supposed to enjoy watching. I mean, I'm just a weirdo like that. And I mean, I've seen this movie <laughs> too many times. It makes great background watching, for real. Oh, sure. But uh, but yeah, it's, there's not a single person to like except maybe Dean. We haven't talked much about Dean, and he, I think he's maybe the only decent person in the movie. I mean, he's the best, but he's also not good because he also seems yeah. a little predatory because he's older than her. And he clearly mm -hmm. wants something from her. But as soon as she tells him her age, he, like, backs off. He, he does not make an advance on her. He is aware. He never tries to use her. The only thing in my mind that makes him kind of, like, iffy is that there is that kind of throwaway line when he's at the motel because he has a deal with Keanu Reeves. Mm. Where, like, Keanu Reeves says, yeah, there's a new girl in this room. You can go hit her up for to do model pictures. Like, that, that, that's, what he, that's where he gets his girls from. Oh, uh, well, no. I didn't think they had met each No, they hadn't met each other. Because really? he, when, he, he, when he confronts him, he's like, are you the manager? And he's like, who's asking? Oh, shit. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. He's never met him before. That's just Keanu saying, like, hey, if you're not getting something out of this deal besides photos, there's other runaways ar around right. here, other young girls. Uh... You know, that's just, that's just Keanu being skeevy. So, I mean. But I don't know. think you're wrong. Trace, I do think that Dean is kind of patrolling this area because when they talk about how they met, it was like happenstance. They just happened to see each other on the street or right. at a store or something like that. So, yeah. I mean, the other thing for me is when they go for their date and she comes out and she says, oh, I got signed by this Roberta woman who's a big deal. And his first thing is like, did she say anything about the pictures? Yeah. Yeah. I do love her flippant. Um... It didn't really come up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> okay, so we're we're technically still at this Sarno show. So when Sarah's audition does not go well, she ends up going into the bathroom and shattering the bathroom mirror. And then Jesse goes to console her and Sarah slashes her hand and sucks at the wound. So one thing I actually want to point out, because I'm not very familiar with Abby Lee. I, I know her from this and I know her from Mad Max Fury Road. Like, that's it. Mm-hmm. She's a supermodel, and she apparently uh, was very, like, she taught, like, Elle Fanning a lot, like, how, how to do the runway walk. Like, it was a very, like, a mentor-protege relationship behind mm -hmm. the scenes, which okay. I find very refreshing. Right. Also to see, you know, I begin in a film that's accused of being misogynistic, to have, to know that behind the scenes there was a very collaborative effort between the women to help each other out. Mm -hmm. It does kind of ease some of the the trauma of this movie. I feel like. <laughs> yeah, I think Bella Heathcote said the same thing about Abby. She said mm -hmm. that they got along very, very well. And it was there was actually quite a lot of female camaraderie on the set. Yeah, I really love Abby Lee in this movie. That's something that like kind of mm -hmm. stuck out on this most recent rewatch was like, even in that audition scene, like her background acting of just like the faces she makes the like things that she does with her hands. And yeah. then when Jesse gets the job, there's a shot of her, and I didn't notice before. She just sheds one single tear. Yes. And mm -hmm. it's, like, really great. Like, little details like that. There's, like, a scene at the end, like, whenever she, like, eats the eyeball, she, no. like, drools yeah. a little bit. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. tiny things. Like, I, I love her. She, but I think she does the single tear during the eyeball bit, too. When she watches... She yeah. yeah, when she watches Gigi kill herself, she, she has the one tear, but gets over that real quick. Well, I mean, because you got it, right? Mm -hmm. Again, like I kind of advocate for this film as a bit of a fairy tale. And I think of Sarah and Gigi as the quote unquote ugly stepsisters who are just yeah. constantly trying to get whatever Cinderella's got. 
with uh with Jenna Malone as the evil stepmother. I guess so. She is the ringleader. She does take Al Fanning and under her wing, mm-hmm. sort of. And if you if you look at it in like you know kind of grand scheme of it too, like I kind of look at them as you know if you want to follow down the path of like you know symbolism and like you know the kind of recurring cycle of these women in mm-hmm. in L.A. You know, Sarah is kind of the has been. She's the one that's like getting older she's not getting booked for stuff as much and then Gigi is like represents the manufactured beauty like she's just keeps getting all the shit done she even calls herself the bionic woman and then you know (laughs) jesse is pure she hasn't had anything you know Mm -hmm. changed about her yet she hasn't uh she's super young because there's a scene where someone says like after 21 you're not relevant and then a guy goes try 20 so it's like you know like it's a, a vicious cycle obviously Right. Yep. So this is the point in the film where we actually start to move away from Jesse a little bit. And I'll confess, it's also a little bit of where the film starts to lose me. So we see Ruby as she arrives at the morgue to do makeup on cadavers. So we just get a sense a little bit more of who she is as a person. And then Jesse goes back to the motel. She's cleaning out the wound that she got from Sarah on the job, and she passes out. And then this is where we see the interaction between Dean and Hank about the room damages. We get the hint of some kind of nefarious activity with a 13-year-old who's staying in the room next door to Jesse. And that, of course, will come into play later in a very grim way. And this is also, yeah, because like whenever Jesse goes back to her room, this is, she's like having visions, she's mm-hmm. seeing things, she's seeing this this triangular symbol thing, which is blue now, but will eventually become red after her transformation. Yep. So do, do y'all get anything from this? I, I didn't do any research into like runes or symbols or shit like this, but I didn't know if this symbol meant anything to y'all. I mean, I know, I know in geometry, like triangles represent like the <laughs> delta, which does represent transforming in like a mathematical uh, equation there you go. but i mean that's just like the very simple one i don't know about like the configurations with like multiple triangles but i do know it does represent transformation so like you know mm-hmm. she has the thing brewing in her she has it already and i don't think they knew that they thought that she was just another you know new girl coming in and then they don't realize like how powerful she truly is you know right. before mm-hmm. the whole thing happens Yeah, I looked at it as I got a little literal with it, which is like, oh, they're all individual triangles. And when you put them together, they become stronger. So it's like, hint, hint, we're going to eat you. (laughs) So that too. That's funny that you say that, because the whole time I was watching it, I was like, that's just the Triforce from the Zelda games, but upside down. Oh, God. (laughs) No, no, no. But in in the Zelda games, each triangle represents its uh, wisdom, courage, and something else. But when you put them together, (laughs) you can have all the power in the world. Like, basically, when you you bring the Triforce together, anything you wish will be granted. Hmm. Okay. So we we now have a Legend of Zelda reading for this film. (laughs) But upside down, because it's like like the upside down crucifix, where it's like, that's Satan. So this is like the upside down, like, it's evil. Right. Yes. So this is where we get one of the more psychedelic and surreal moments of the film. So uh, Gigi is surprised to learn that Jesse will be walking in the show for Sarno. And she walks last, which of course means that she has the highest position of all the models. And this is where she sees said geometric shape. And then, yeah, we get strobing lights and she sees herself and her mirror self starts to lick the other mirrors and her expression changes the lighting changes from blue to red and this is where we basically shift from melodrama to horror film and this is a five minute sequence i timed i was like this is five minutes (laughs) it goes on for so long (laughs) it is a lot are you ready for my stoner theory on this scene yes (laughs) this scene for me this is when the transformation is complete pretty Mm -hmm. much yeah. Because after this scene, this is when we get the change in demeanor of Jesse. I believe like the whole triangle glass thing. I feel like that's her performance in the in the runway. And she's like kind of watching herself like disembodied because mm-hmm. now that thing that was in her is now, you know, taking over. It's, it's taking no over. longer. It's no longer just Jesse anymore. And right. this is her giving into it, though. You know, she's watching it happen. And that's that's what I read into this, because then after this, she's a completely different person. 
Which I actually do want to commend because I, I realize I again, I, despite my criticisms of some of this film, again, I still like it. It's a three and a half for me, but I do want to commend Elle Fanning because while I don't think she's really given a lot to do, these subtle changes in her posture, mm-hmm. her tone, her inflections, everything that changes after the scene is noticeable, but it's so subtle yeah. that it's like, ooh. Going with the title of the film then, though, so do we want to say maybe this is the Neon Demon possessing her? Yes. Okay. That is exactly what I'm saying. I can definitely see it. I've always read the title as a kind of glittery pop punk version riff on the green eyed demon because it's all about jealousy, but it's like because we're in mm-hmm. the fashion world and it's neon. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's also Ruffin, and he fucking loves his 80s aesthetic, and Neon just makes sense in that regard. Yeah. Okay, so uh, then we get this scene in the restaurant where Sarno, ugh, the worst, he just espouses <laughs> all about the value of natural beauty, and he, like, shits on Gigi, he shits on Dean, and Jesse's like, cool, I like this guy, everybody else can fuck off. So, I actually really... <laughs> When he makes Gigi stand up, you know what he's about to do, because we've already Mm -hmm. heard her entire Mm -hmm. monologue about all the work she had done. Yeah. I find this very funny, and I find it very cathartic from a pure karma standpoint. Like, (laughs) put this, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm calling her a bitch, but like, put put this bitch in her place, because she's been a bitch, nothing but for this entire movie. But you love a bitch! I know! (laughs) And then she got dunked on. Like, Uh, it's it's definitely beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) No, there's no better insult in this film than this, yeah, she's fine. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yes fine has never been weaponized to such a degree <laughs> and even though he is like you know pretty much waxing on the very you know on the nose things when mm-hmm. he says things like if you aren't born beautiful you never will be mm-hmm. beauty is the highest form of currency we have beauty isn't everything it's the only thing yeah I feel like Refn knows, though, because, I mean, this dude wears the same frame glasses that he does. I don't know. I'd right. like to think he maybe has a sense of humor and says, you know what? I'll just make him look like me anyways. Yeah, like, like this is his mouthpiece in the film. <laughs> and it it's so self-knowing and wink, wink, nudge, nudge that you have to think that Refn's in on the joke. Oh, he 100% yeah. is. But I also think that this monologue is the first thing he wrote in the film and he built a film around it. Oh, I could see it. Yeah. I mean, just based on all the quotes he said about the film in general, right. which are mostly things pulled from this monologue, I have to be like, all right, you knew you wanted to use women. You knew it wanted to be about beauty. What do you think about beauty? Cool, we're going to write this. And then, boom, let's build this film around it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now we get the hardest potentially scene in the film. <sighs> this is when Jesse returns to her Pasadena motel and she is sexually assaulted by Hank and made to fillet a knife. Okay, do y'all think... I, I thought this was, it was a, a dream. dream. It's a dream. It was a dream. Okay. Yeah. But we still had to see it. No, yeah. And as he continually says, wider, wider, wider. It's deeply upsetting. What? It's okay, what do y'all make upsetting. it as? I'm dying to know. Uh, you got me on this one. Uh, I think it's just gross to be gross. Uh, mm. Do you think it's that she has a sense of premonition at this point? Like, she knows that it's not safe? I mean, Devon, I would have thought that you'd say, oh, this is, like, Ruby being like, you're in danger, girl, you gotta come to my side. Well, I'll say that's the case later in a different scene. Okay. But not this one, though. I, okay, I'm I'm, I'm gonna just spout, because I don't don't know. I I don't know what the purpose of this scene is. Because the fact that it's all from Jesse's POV, it's something in her subconscious that's making her dream this, right? And that's Mm -hmm. kind of where I'm getting lost. Unless it's like, (sighs) she now knows that men can use her and abuse her, Mm -hmm. and she will, she's above it all. She's gonna come out. She can do what the men ask of her. She can do what men want of her. Men can demean her, but she's still gonna be better than them. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, again, like it's her subconscious dreaming of a man assaulting her. I don't know. I mean, I think it's kind of like what you just said, though. Like, it's just maybe just a premonition of just this constant threat of danger that she has around her from, like, literally every corner. Right. Like, but did it need to be that? Maybe not. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it could have been a lot worse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I don't know that it could have been that that much worse i haven't seen a lot of knife elating i 
I don't feel like the scene is necessary, and not to this degree. We could have had some other inciting incident that would have made Jesse run to Ruby. It didn't have to be this, and it didn't have to be her waking up locking the door to prevent an actual sexual assault, and then right. hearing some 13-year-old girl getting, we don't even know, and we don't want yeah, to Yeah, I mean, either raped or murdered or raped and murdered. I mean, that yeah, yeah that that's harder to watch for sure, like, more than even the knife scene for me, like, of just, like, Jesse, like, also, like, not doing anything about it, but then in my brain, like I said, a theory was that, like, Ruby or one of the other girls, like, kind of, like, simulated the person trying to break in, so that way Jesse would run to Ruby. Oh, like, this Maybe. is just another, another Witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. It's very Macbeth. I like it. Yeah. When, whenever I watch this movie again, whenever I have to watch it for podcasts, I guess, I, I'm, I'm going to watch it with that mindset of, like, they're witches and they're doing this. Like, they're, they're orchestrating, they're, they're the puppet masters in this whole movie. <laughs> Definitely for a lot of it. Mm-hmm. So Jesse does run to Ruby's absolutely palatial house, which we learn later she's apparently just house-sitting. I don't know that I buy that, but yeah. uh, sure. So, interestingly... Ruby is dressed in her signature color. This is where we get full predatory lesbians, so we do have another sexual assault. So maybe it's just the premonition that men and women are equally bad. Like, men will try to assault you and take advantage of you. Women will try to assault you and take advantage of you. It's equal opportunity rapists. Oh, God, Trace, when you say it like Mm. that. I mean, not... (laughs) No, but (laughs) That is what it is, though. Like, it's like um, when The Sweetest Thing came out, and it was like, hey, we just want to prove that women can be just as gross as men, like an American pie. That's, hey, you thought that only men could rape? So can women. Oh, is it the same thing? Is it? It's the exact same thing. Oh, my God. I do think that the scene is interesting because at this point, we find out that Jesse is a virgin, and the whole film has been presented that the women are talking about sex and what you have to use your sexual wiles, your sexual energy to get ahead in the business. And we learn that the it factor that Jesse has is maybe her virginity as well, which is equally icky. I mean, I just kind of, again, saw it as just like a general purity thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, but yes, the the obvious case of being the virgin and... I do like this scene, though. Um, I know some people kind of get uh, lost on, like, the shift that kind of, like, goes into, like, slasher territory here, or almost, like, oh, Jalo vibes. I like it. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, like the color it. coding is very Jalo, right? Like, Ruby's dressed in red, and Jesse is dressed in all white, and it's very, like, oh, like, semiotics 101. Ooh, and Abby Lee's punch to, like, kick off this, like, chase scene. Oh, no, wait, we're wait. not there yet. <laughs> we're Solid. not there yet. <laughs> Oh, we're not there. We're still at Jenna Malone trying to rape her, and then we still have this necrophilia scene. I was going to say, we got to get through the necrophilia. Oh, yeah, we got to get to, yes, (laughs) of course. But actually, Joe, on top of that, though, I'm surprised that the transformation that Jesse goes through isn't some kind of deflowering process. Yeah, I guess credit to the film for not making us sit through (laughs) that. I guess. I mean, I guess you could view the fashion show as a sort of deflowering. I think so, actually. But there's no penetration. Okay, good job, Ruffin. You can go sit in your corner. We're not talking about penetration. Because <laughs> remember, he used penetration throughout all the interviews. <laughs> I was like, what? This film will penetrate you. Stop saying the word penetrate. God damn it, now I'm saying it. I'm getting technical about, act, like, <laughs> what is that in Chasing Amy when, like, Ben Affleck, like, doesn't, uh, he doesn't think that lesbians can actually have sex because there's no penetration? Oh, God. Is that, like, how real lesbians don't scissor? Uh... <laughs> I, I, no, no comment. <laughs> Let's just uh, call back to our handmaiden episode. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Ruby has been denied, and she picks herself up quite calmly, all things considered, and uh, then she goes to the morgue and she pleasures herself using a woman's corpse. Um, did y'all see this in theaters? I yes, did I did. <laughs> Could you feel? The uncomfortableness from everyone in the audience when this scene escalated. <laughs> oh, people walked out. People straight up walked out of my yeah, of my showing. I heard about one that. of my friends wanted to, and I said, "You sit your ass down." But why? But... <laughs> I mean this honestly. This is not that graphic. This is actually quite tasteful. And yes, we are watching a person have sex with a dead person. But honestly, we have seen this before. 
and far worse. I think for me, it's just... (laughs) <laughs> this is so bad. It's not even the act of it being a dead person. It's not even the act of necrophilia. It's the saliva spit line that connects yep. their mouths towards the end of it. <laughs> into into the mouth. I mean, but this was like, this was Jenna Malone's idea, though. Yeah. That was like, I remember in my brain, I was just like, I was like, I don't know whose idea this is, but she is going for it. And then once I learned that it like was her idea, I was like, oh, yeah, she just went for it. So, yes, to expand upon that, yeah, basically she was just supposed to kiss the corpse, apparently, and it was Malone's idea to go further with, like, a full-on sex scene, Uh, which... Queen. (laughs) I also love it, though, right? Because it's like, oh, she was rejected by this living being, so the only, like, passion she can get is from this corpse, this, this thing that can't possibly return any kind of affection for her. Well, or it can't reject her. Oh, yes, there you go. Mm. So I do have an interesting article. Bear with me. This is a little bit lengthier, but this is from Eliza Chavez. It's a Medium article called The Neon Demon and Female Blasphemy or Why Lesbian Necrophilia is Sometimes a Good Thing. Oh, my God. (laughs) This is why you go on Medium, folks, because you'll find great (laughs) stuff. Okay, so Chavez says, The scene is framed solely through Ruby's desires, as twisted as they are. When Jessie appears as a fantasy, she's lounging on a couch in a robe and nightgown. She touches her breasts through her clothes and makes bedroom eyes, but while she's sensual, she's not pornographic. Ruby, too, stays fully clothed. The corpse is not depicted as a sexual object so much as an object object. You can practically taste the formaldehyde. You can't possibly ignore the stitches that slash across her sternum, and it's the polar opposite of titillating. I found myself thinking something like, this is fucking awful. Get it, girl. (laughs) I wanted the stitches to rip open. I kept thinking that was going to happen, too. (laughs) Okay, a little bit more. Yep. It's that most of the time in horror, men get to do the deprived and interesting shit. Ruby's pleasure is not for us to consume. We can't see her naked body, and every time we do, it's in relation to a corpse, dampening our secondhand desire. We can fully identify with her in objectifying Jessie, but that's as close as we get, and there's something empowering about a woman's lust that's so gory and weird we can't get inside of it. Oh. So I do want to point out that when you said Ruby 2 stays fully clothed, I just I totally heard Ruby Tuesdays. Oh my god. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Come on down to Ruby Tuesdays, y'all. We've got the best corpses. You can ride them and then eat them. <laughs> I keep forgetting to I mean again, they're all fantasizing about a 17-year-old girl, so it's not just rape. It's not it's pedophilia. It's statutory rape. Like that's not like uh it's just like blah. so she's she's not only doing necrophilia, doing necrophilia? <laughs> sure. One, two, yes. It's while having pedophilic fantasies, which is bizarre to me. It's a lot. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I I love that reading. Yeah, female sexuality is complicated. <laughs> I just like that Ruby, I didn't say I was watching this, but I posted on Twitter that I think Ruby is one of my favorite contemporary horror villains. And I did get a couple of people who wrote back and said, well, she's not really a villain. She's just kind of misunderstood. But I think regardless of how you Mm. read her, if you do think she's the ringleader of a coven of witches, or she's just a makeup artist who really wants to stay young, Ruby is a complicated, interesting figure in this film. And the fact that she doesn't get redeemed, she doesn't get apprehended, she doesn't get murdered, like... She is just kind of this badass, interesting, complicated woman. And I love that this is kind of her climax, quote, unquote. Yeah, quote. <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> but because the last we see of her is the blood gushing, right? Correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which we are more or less up to. So now we get a bit of stock and slash. We are back at the house. Jesse stands on this diving board at the empty pool. So, you know, I'm like, girl, what are you doing? Oh, but she's given this this monologue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this hor- I mean, sorry, I'm going to say horrendous monologue. It's a good monologue, but it makes her so utterly despicable. She's so narcissistic at this point, right? Mm-hmm. She's gone. Yeah. But I love that this is contrasted to that scene that she had, uh, what's his name, Dean, the photographer? Yeah. 
when she has that date with Dean, it's similarly shot where we can see the skyline of Los Angeles behind her in the night. And it's like that first scene is about, you know, how she wanted to be discovered. And she was thinking about whether the moon would be the only thing that ever saw her. And here she's like, I'm the fucking queen of the universe. Look (laughs) at me. You're all simpletons. (laughs) Again, obvious, but I think it really works. I do think that the staging of these slashing scenes is really good. Like, it's not a lot of editing. It's a lot of her running through long halls. But it's, like, it's also very pink and blue. I mean, the colors are all here, of course. But Mm -hmm. if I cared about, like, if I had more of empathy towards Jesse, this would actually, I think, be a very, like, scary sequence. Because the way these girls corner her is, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's good. It feels like a pack of animals to me. Mm -hmm. These women have turned on her and they are stalking her. And then, you know, they basically shepherd her back to the pool. And then this is where Ruby finishes her off. Like, oh, thank you for delivering me to the ringleader, pushing the pool. They attack her like a mountain lion, maybe? Mm -hmm. A pack of mountain lions? (laughs) Devon's like, there's a deleted scene where she transfers from a cat. Oh my god, can you imagine if we had a, tra- like a practical effects transformation scene of Jenna Malone becoming a mountain lion? Uh, <laughs> I would like to see it. Uh, cutting it. her on the floor. <laughs> um, the part where we see what has happened to Jesse is... I mean, we don't actually get to see them eating her or draining her blood into the bathtub, but just seeing her with the broken arms and legs splayed out and the blood spreading along the bottom of the pool, it's really good. I want to say that I want, is it what, seven pints of blood that are in the human body? You cannot fill a bathtub with it. Yeah, you cannot fill a bathtub. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they mix that with water. <laughs> <laughs> kind of dilute yeah. it a little bit. Yeah, but I mean, and, and it also mimics a shot from whenever uh, Dean shows up and then like she like grabs the flowers but then passes out mm-hmm. and she's like sprawled out. It's like literally like kind of like the same position. Yeah, yeah. You know, and also like kind of mimicking, you know, at the beginning with her covered in blood at the beginning of the movie. But yep. yeah. So th- this scene, I-, I imagine, I mean, I'm imagining, I'm, I'm-, I'm thinking that because we're watching not only Ruby just sitting in the bathtub staring at the at Gigi and Sarah bathing nude. Yeah. In slow-mo. In slow-mo. I mean, it is just watching two naked girls wash blood off of themselves very sensually mm-hmm. for about a minute. I mean... I will say it is the first form of nudity of the film yeah. mm-hmm. and for the first form of nudity to not be, you know, like uh, some other unnecessary sex scene. You know, this is I mean, they're bathing together, but it's not like they're like doing it, you know. So I don't know. I feel like it's like supposed to be like a empowering scene. That's what I was. I, I agree with you, Devon. Like, I don't. I can see someone watching this and being like, this feels lecherous, this feels gratuitous, this feels gross, and I don't think that's the case. I don't feel like this, it's voyeuristic, but I don't think it's creepy that the camera's watching them. I don't know. I think it's somewhere in between for me, where it lingers a little too much to the point where I start to feel Ruffin's male gaze, even though I know we're actually meant to see it through, obviously, Ruby's eyes. It stays on it a little too long, but it does feel like it's a like a celebration slash, yeah, like a cleansing ceremony, right? Like, we have done the thing, and now we will await our prize. We will be gorgeous. Let me touch that skin. Regarding the male gaze, too, actually, and I, obviously I know the director has a, say, a big hand and will get shot. Cinematographer is actually a woman. Mm-hmm. So, more female energy on this set. Interesting. Yeah, and actually... Chavez does make a note in her Medium article. She does talk about the fact that the cinematographer is a female and she felt it most in the uh, necrophilia scene because of the way it's staged and stuff. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so um, Jesse is now done. Jesse's out of this movie. (laughs) And we still have 20 minutes to go. (laughs) Yeah. Which is like, again, a very interesting and unexpected subversion of expectation. You don't Mm -hmm. think Elle Fanning's just going to peace out with 20 minutes left in this movie? Yeah. No. Oh, I guess we should acknowledge. Okay, so after the cleansing and stuff, we do get to see Ruby washing the blood off of the pavement topless. And here we can see, I never read them as cult insignias. I always just thought that she had a lot of tattoos, but apparently a lot of people read them as cult symbols. I mean, yeah. 
I, I'd read that. Like, uh, again, if like Ruby was just a little bit more knowledgeable of the whole ritual thing than the other girls. But also, I mean, just a mood, you know, just like walking mm-hmm. around shirtless, watering plants, washing blood off. It's a shirtless. Sunday morning. Yeah, it's a Sunday morning. Yeah. I love that we never get a like, it's it's again it's one shot we never get a shot to cut to the pool to see the blood getting washed away we just stay on her and yeah regarding the tattoos like we don't get a close up of any of them no. so it's not like Refn saying hey these tattoos mean something this isn't Ari Aster being like pay attention to the walls in midsummer <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> But uh, clearly, yeah, like you said, Joe, people have picked up on that. So there's something about these tattoos. Because, again, none of these are Jenna Malone's actual tattoos. So they're there for no. a reason. Yes. Oh, 100%. But Refn doesn't, like... We don't linger on it. No, not at all. So it's just like, hey, if you notice it, you notice it. If not, um, enjoy this topless shot of Jenna Malone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we get some full moon action. And uh, Ruby's last scene in this film is shooting... A torrent of blood out of her vagina. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Question for both of you, though, though. So, because right before this, we have Ruby lying in the grave. Right. Mm -hmm. Which, I guess, is for the bones. (laughs) Because they've eaten all of the rest of Mm Jesse. But here's the thing. In this little plot of land, there's other, like, rose bushes. And what I thought was that this is actually their gravesite for all of their victims. And the rose, or the flower bushes, like, they come out of the ground are from all the different girls they've killed. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that supports Devon's theory that they've done this, or at least Ruby has done this several times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The question is, is the homeowner one of those bodies? And that's why they're able to stay in this gorgeous mansion. <laughs> if there's a sequel, the homeowner is going to be like the, the, the mother of tears. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is a wrap on Jenna Malone. She is now out of this movie. And wait. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but just, like, dude, what do y'all make of the blood coming out of her vagina? Like, she likes it, it seems like. Oh, like, yeah, she's, no. She's not having a bad reaction. And, and that and that is what definitely supports um, Ruby having done this. I think she kind of just knew there was, it was a full moon situation. She mm-hmm. knew where to position herself and knew it was coming. So she knows it's a part of the process. Do you feel like it's a birthing scene or like she is expelling like expelling i think it's like she took in the blood and meat and whatever else they ate you know absorbed the uh vitality the life mm-hmm. force and then expelling it Ooh, back out okay. maybe expelling the blood of the or like the, the the aura or the source of the last girl she ate like she's just been oh, feeding on that? the last girl this whole time well no like maybe like let's say they do this once a year it's like an oil change. Yeah, oh, out God. with the old, in with the new. The body shop model of the <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> Gigi goes in for some touch-ups on her nose and her cheekbones, and Ruby's like, cool, I just gotta get something out of my JJ." Pretty much. Nice, okay. Well, it looked like a bit of a heavy flow day. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'll probably cut that out. <clears throat> So, our final scenes are at Jack's latest photo shoot, because Desmond Harrington is still a character in this movie, and we are introduced to this new model, Annie, who is a whippersnapper. She's very excited. She's very opinionated about ageism in the modeling industry, and she's (laughs) working there with Gigi, and Sarah's just, like, hanging out, looking not happy with her life. There is that great exchange where Annie asks what she did to another model who stole her gig, and Sarah just kind of nonchalantly says, I ate her. <laughs> it's like, oh, it was last night, by the way. <laughs> yeah, basically. Love it. <laughs> love it so much. I also do love how unceremoniously Annie is just fired because Jack has taken notice of Sarah, so Annie is just done, and Sarah takes her place. Meaning it worked? It totally yeah. worked. Oh, yeah. yeah, 100% it worked. It was like, oh, ba bang. It worked for Sarah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So as they're standing by the pool, Gigi becomes sick because she is looking at the pool and I guess remembering what she just did. So she rushes inside and she eventually vomits up Jesse's eye and then dies by suicide using a pair of scissors. The vomiting up of the eyeball is... Not good? Good? So oh, it's it, it's good in terms of it looks good. Mm-hmm. It is so gross. Like, <laughs> the, so so th- this final scene, 
I don't know what it is. It turns me off so much. And it's not that I don't like it. It's just this whole final scene is so, like, upsetting to me. Like, I don't like watching this scene. Even though as a horror fan and someone who enjoys watching, like, fucked up shit. Mm -hmm. Like, I actually find this more disturbing than the necrophilia scene. Oh, sure. I don't know. So, Devon, actually, going back to you, because you said, like, it doesn't work for Gigi because... Their grooming of Jesse went too far. Like, she yeah. crossed a line somewhere. So so you think that because Jesse achieved, I don't know, like, her full potential as a model in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, that... Yes, that's exactly it. Like, I think that they did too good of a job to where she was no longer pure anymore. She was corrupted. She gave in to this world she was 100 percent bought in she made the transformation so she became too powerful so like with uh Gigi dying because she even said something about like i can still feel her mm -hmm. and like you know like she's you know that powerful to where like oh hey the ritual didn't work how you think it is kind of similar to like jennifer's body you know, she right. became a succubus because they did the ritual thinking she was a virgin, but she wasn't. Oh, yeah. So now, Jesse, she was no longer pure. She bought into everything. She's corrupted. So my reading of this, so hey, do we know if Sarah has had any work done? Because to my knowledge, we are not told that she's had work done. She no. doesn't say it. So my, my reading of this has always been... That because we had that whole monologue from Alessandro Nivola earlier about how, like, you know, natural beauty, blah, 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 like, you can tell when it's artificially made, because Gigi has had work done to alter her appearance, right. that's why it doesn't work for her. Mm. Yes. Okay. It's artificiality mixing with natural beauty, and that's what fucks her over. Whereas with Sarah, she hasn't had that work done, and neither has Jenna Malone. They have both kept their natural beauty, and so therefore mm. um, Jesse's natural beauty works with her. So it's like, yeah, the film is punishing Gigi for pla mm. for having plastic surgery for altering her face. Ooh, okay. Mm. I could buy yeah. that. I'm, I'm I'm in it. I, I buy I buy it too. <laughs> yeah. So. Needless to say, Gigi does not survive this. She ends up just dying. And Sarah, mostly unfazed, aside from the single tear, pops the eyeball into her mouth and returns to work. And that is the end of the film. <laughs> the drip of drool whenever she yeah. goes to get it. And also I have like a I have a horror themed sleeve of tattoos and I mm -hmm. have a drawing of Abby eating the eyeball that I'm what? gonna get. Oh my god! No, I don't have it yet, but I have oh, the drawing, okay. and I'm gonna get it. It's Amazing. like my next one. Yeah, it's Oof. gonna be sick. Oh my god, <laughs> Abby Lee <laughs> eating an eyeball. Yum, That's yum. awesome. No, I mean, like, and there's something to say. I mean, you know, Abby Abby Lee's performance is very understated in this because, yeah, she has her single tear going, so she is clearly moderately affected by seeing her friend kill herself, mm -hmm. but not enough to the point where she's like, well. <laughs> They're waiting for me. That photo shoot is not going to finish itself. Yeah, <laughs> girls got to work. I've only got until twenty one. Time is running out. That eyeball. It's. I mean, yeah, she swallows it whole. Like, I mean, I, I, and you, I don't even think you see her swallow it either. Like, it just like it's just it's in her mouth, and yeah. all of a sudden, it's like part of her. It's great. Like a caramel candy. She's sucking mm. on. Yum 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 mm. yum yum. <laughs> it's uh, it's so <laughs> gross. Uh, so, all right. That is the Neon Demon, y'all. Final thoughts. Go ahead, Devon. I mean, it's a movie that I definitely get sucked into the style of it all. I mean, just the way it looks, the way things are framed, the colors, the the mirror shots, you know. I'm I'm into it all because I'm a person that is a style is substance. I don't like the criticism style over substance or not that it's not a merited criticism, but I think it's overused. And right. I think that this movie does it does things for, you know, pure aesthetic purposes, but, like, the movie is about beauty and aesthetic. You know, there's even, you know, little shots that they'll linger on just, like, Jesse breathing, you know, just to, like, kind of add this extra little layer of... But they are showing that from that, like, mirror scene. You think it's your look at her and that zooms out and it's actually a mirror. I'm like, that's a scene that could have been a throwaway thing, but just to add that little extra flair in it, like, I think that will enhance a film for me personally mm -hmm. so it's like i'm in it on you know the visual aesthetic the uh the music cliff martinez score i listen to the score when i like do yoga ah. it's just uh i don't know it's a film that i can just 
return to constantly and just like let myself kind of get sucked into it but then also admire it from a you know artistic standpoint of like you know me personally like it's just very much my type of shit like this is pure spooky nonsense bullshit (laughs) but it's beautiful and you know i can just let my mind wander and come up with these theories nice well, I appreciate your passion for this. <laughs> I, like I said at the beginning, you know, I, I like this movie. I appreciate this movie. I don't really enjoy watching it, and I don't really ever want to see it again. <laughs> God, it's still yeah. a three, but but it's still a three and a half out of five. Right. Fun little uh, tidbits because I, I I've already said my piece on it though. One, I came by to mention this earlier. Elle Fanning replaced Carrie Mulligan after Mulligan had to drop out due to scheduling conflicts, which makes sense considering Mulligan was the female lead of Drive. Right. Also, for all of our Scream heads, the mansion in this final scene is the very same mansion from Scream 3. Blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> so weird. Okay, so for my final thoughts, I'm going to kick it back over to Lauren Wilford from the Gradient article, because I really like the way that she describes the film. So she says, The Neon Demon is an aesthetic vision of femininity as construction. Femininity as consumer product. Femininity as weapon and armor. It's the tapping of acrylic nails and the clicking of stiletto heels, the sheen of leather and vinyl, the sharp points of toes and shoulder pads. It's the buzz and shriek of the synthesizer, the garish palette of grape candy and aquamarine, the high-pitched belt of Cindy Lauper and Madonna. It's glitter and diamonds, plastic and gold, neon and strobe. It's lip stain and lip gloss and setting spray, the body and face as perfectible and sealable. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it was a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> I like it. No, it just uh, it is a list. Um, yeah, yeah. This movie is shiny and plastic. <laughs> I mean, it opens with glitter. I... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and man. that's the Neon Demon. It is. And listeners, I I'm intrigued to see what y'all think of this and if you're angry at us for making you watch it or if you're a fan of this film because i feel like we're going to get a wide range of reactions to this film (laughs) Mm -hmm. all right everybody well that has been the neon demon first devon thank you for coming on to talk about this because it's always nice when we have someone who's really passionate about the film and you definitely brought it today absolutely oh thank you so much for having me You know, again, I like movies that are just conversation pieces, and it it is definitely a bonus when it is, like, just something that is very aesthetically pleasing to me as well. So, yeah, it's Mm -hmm. definitely a movie that, um, I don't know, I draw a lot of inspiration on Mm -hmm. and try not to take it too seriously. So, thanks. There you go. Well, let everyone know, where, where can they find you on social media? Yeah, you guys can find me on Twitter at underscore Daddy Disco. Um, I host a podcast, the Blade Blunt Cinema Club. We talk about horror films. We do it by subgenre. So every month is like a different theme. Uh, we're doing a Final Destination coming up. So nice. uh, yeah, you can find me there and uh, on Instagram at underscore Daddy Disco. I uh, sometimes do spooky uh, short films and uh, photography. So you can go check that out. Nice. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, well, if you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at Horror Queers. Join our Facebook Horror Queers group and find us on Letterboxd to keep track of all the films we've covered. And we've also got a YouTube channel, so if you want to see us talk instead of just hear us, um, go check that out. And if you have a moment, please rate and review us on your podcatcher of choice. And of course, finally, if you want even more content, please support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horrorqueers. We are almost at the end of our Ghosts and Zombies theme month, so subscribe to Patreon to hear episodes on Seance and Ouija Origin of Evil for the ghost stuff, and Army of the Dead and the Dawn of the Dead remake for the zombie stuff. <laughs> oh, fun stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joe. Yes. What are we, oh my god, what are we checking out next week? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've done quite a few contemporary and more well-known films this month, so we're gonna cap it off with something a little less recognizable going to hop across to the UK to talk about The Wolves of Cromer. I've never heard of this movie. I do not know what it is about. Everyone, though, you might be like me. Go to JustWatch.com and see where it's streaming, because it actually is streaming at quite a few places. But right. um, 
it's always fun to um, walk into one of these things totally blind because I have no idea what to expect with this one. I know. Yeah, it's a first time watch for both of us. So we started it that way with Mirror Mirror at the beginning of the month and we're closing it off. Well, technically June starts. With technically that, June. Yeah, okay, <laughs> fine, fine. Technicalities. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, oh, I don't know why I clapped. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, everyone. That it will be the Neon Demon, so we can cross out the Neon Demon. Indeed. And cross out horror queers. You've made it to the end of another bloody disgusting podcast. Congratulations. It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this, as he says he is hardly equal to the task, and he wants an exact record kept. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past. I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Regarding Dracula wherever you listen to podcasts or find us online at bloody.fm.